Hey Toronto, if you're feeling stuck in the city right now, you are not alone. Pulling your hair out in traffic or sweating it out in a bus stop. Toronto commutes are on average an hour. Last year ranking third worst in all of North America. Maybe you're feeling stuck with your pad. Back to back 20% average rent increases could do that to you. And with average home prices around a million, many are writing off buying altogether. But mix in some of the best restaurants and nightlife in the world, and maybe that will even the score. Now, with inflation through the roof, the fun things that used to draw so many people to this city now seem painfully out of reach. With all that stuckness, no wonder there's a vibe. The city just isn't working right now. Toronto stands at a crossroads. Renters versus buyers, drivers versus transit riders, suburbanites versus downtowners. A city divided, leading to years of squabbling, so much so things often don't get done. Like what to do with the Scarborough RT being decommissioned this year and still we're debating what to replace it with. And Rail Deck Park, that would-be oasis over the tracks, seemed to have momentum and then poof, it was gone and now may be replaced by a condo complex. Even the current situation with Ontario Place, the provincial government says it's going to go ahead and do what it wants with its own land and yet the debate over it continues. So in so many ways, this mayoral by-election is an opportunity to come together. Complaining about Toronto's housing crisis is uniting people, and after decades of underbuilding, Toronto's playing catch-up. There were nearly 250 cranes in use in Toronto this spring. That's more than New York, Boston, LA, Seattle, San Francisco, and Washington, D.C. combined. The sprint to build is being outpaced by Toronto's exceptional population growth. Nearly 180,000 more people live in the city than did just a decade ago, and another 700,000 people are expected by 2051. So the city has a new target to build 285,000 new homes by 2031. And the question is, how? Getting safety under control is another major priority. There have been rare but terrifying moments of random violence this year, including the unprovoked stabbing death on a subway platform of 16-year-old Gabriel Megalis, just coming home from the mall with his friends. Some are calling for more police, some are calling for fewer, but while we figure it out, even a perceived loss of safety is enough to tarnish a world-class tourist destination. What's the point of a world-class city if you can't get anywhere within it? Simultaneously annoying pedestrians, cyclists, transit riders, and drivers. Major sticking points in Toronto, money and authority. It's like borrowing your friend's car. Sure, you're the one driving it, but many things about the car aren't actually up to you. The provincial government not only holds the keys, but owns the car. And the city just always seems to be begging other governments for money. It is time that we stop being treated and I stop being treated as a little boy going up to Queen's Park in short pants. True, people are tripping over themselves trying to replace Toronto's first so-called strong mayor. And after a record 70% of Toronto voters snoozed through the last vote, hopefully more of us peel away from summer and cast a ballot this time around to chart a path forward for the city that makes people feel a little less stuck. Hello everyone and welcome to the CBC Broadcast Centre in downtown Toronto. We've got a live studio audience joining us here in person for our special coverage of Toronto's 2023 mayoral by-election. I am Chris Glover, so happy to be with you again for another election tonight. And hey, if it feels like we were just here, you are not wrong, I do too. Just about four months after winning his third term in office last October, John Tory resigned as mayor earlier this year, kicking off a wide open race for mayor for the first time in Toronto in years. An unprecedented number of candidates answered that call. More than 100 people, even a dog, hoping to take the reins of our beautiful city. And we have you covered tonight with reporters and producers fanned out across this city. And they are going to be at the campaign headquarters of the front runners who could replace John Tory. Our reporters are, of course, standing by live, ready to bring you the reaction from the candidates and their teams. 
Now, unlike normal election shows where we are tracking several races at once, councillors, trustees in Toronto and across the region, tonight only that one race is under the spotlight. Who will be Toronto's next mayor? And Angelina King is joining me with are here in studio with me. She is going to be tracking all of these results for us. And Angelina, it is kind of nice to only have that one race that we have to focus on. Keeps it nice and simple. And elections have a way of just being unpredictable. Sometimes there are problems that pop up. And we've already found out about one delay. Tell us about that first. Yeah, exactly. We think things are going to be straightforward, always keeping us on our toes here. So there's been a few different issues at four polling stations across the city, including a fire alarm and a medical emergency. You might have noticed there were some short power outages in some parts of Toronto, but the city is telling us that did not have an impact. The other reasons, though, did and had enough of an impact for the city to delay all the results by about 15 to 20 minutes. That's because polls will stay open a little bit later at those four locations to kind of make up for that lost time. So while we're waiting for those results to start coming in, there are some numbers I do have right now and I want to go over them with you voter turnout. If we're going by advanced voting numbers, people seem to be quite engaged in this mayoral race. Toronto set a record when it comes to advanced voting. That happened on June 13th. More than 38,000 people voted, which beat the last record set in 1998 for the most advanced ballots cast on a single day. This time around, in total, nearly 130,000 people showed up to vote in advance. That's a 12% increase compared to advance voting in the last municipal election in October. And speaking of that election, Toronto set a record then, not a good one, for the lowest voter turnout at 29.7%. So hopefully we do better this year. It's for the next mayor of Toronto after all. So for now, I'll be keeping my eyes glued to the results as they come in. I'm always here on standby, ready to keep you updated throughout the night on all things numbers. And Angelina, I am grateful to have you there standing by throughout this entire night. Thank you so much. Now, of course, throughout this race, technically even before she officially announced she was running, former NDP MP and city councillor Olivia Chow has been leading in the polls. And Ali Chiasson is live for us tonight at her headquarters. Hey there, Ali. I see people are starting to uh, get there in that big room behind you. What is the vibe like? Well, Chris, there is a lot of excitement in the room here. There's also a lot of purple in the room here. Us in the media, we are stationed on the balcony level of the Great Hall here on Queen West. And we have a pretty good view of all of the people in purple shirts below us. They are, of course, Olivia Chow supporters. We'll be, we'll be looking forward to pulling a couple of the folks aside and having a chat with them. Speaking of chatting with people. I just spoke with Olivia Chow a little earlier as she was taking a site tour of the venue here and she took one look at the purple lights and the backdrop there and said, hmm, okay, I think I'm going to go with the yellow dress. She says she is feeling calm, cool, and collected heading into night. She took the TTC all across the city. She said she was receiving a lot of high fives saying, hey, Olivia, I'm on my way to to vote for you or I'm just coming back from voting but Chris we will have to see if those high fives actually do turn in to votes back to you certainly and that is why elections are so fun to watch thank you Ali now throughout the evening CBC Toronto's municipal affairs reporter Sean Jeffords is going to be here in studio dissecting everything analyzing this race along with me can you believe that we're back in the same spot again. Honestly, Chris, who could have ever <laughs> predicted it? It's been a real whirlwind, but is, here we uh, are. Yes, and so Ali was just saying that she had talked to Olivia Chow. She's feeling calm, cool, and collected. Of course, this does feel like her race to lose. What do you think her chances are tonight? You know, I think so much depends on this ground game whether Olivia Chow has been able to turn out her vote, whether her machine has been able to get those voters that she, frankly, seemed to have showing up in all of these polls it headed up to advance or to election day mm -hmm. and whether they turn out for her. And I guess we're going to see, Chris, you know. Well, for sure we will. Now, former police chief Mark Saunders really led the attacks against Chow, and he did pick up a significant endorsement himself from Doug Ford and had a good ground game behind him, but seemed to be slipping in the polls. What do you think his chances are tonight? You know, you've got two real important uh, endorsements here, right? You had former Mayor John Tory's endorsement of Anna Bailao, which, you know, 
that could swing votes. And you had uh, Premier Doug Ford weighing in on Friday with that robocall, really explicitly endorsing Saunders. And I wonder if that will have the desired impact. Both of them came so late in this contest. We're going to have to see if voters were paying attention and tuned in and if it motivates them. Well, and speaking about Bailao, it does seem if there's another candidate she would be the one that might break through. Why do you think that might be specifically for her? You know, not just the Tory endorsement, although that I think is a pretty big factor here, but Anna Bailao also has a very well organized machine behind her as well. A lot of money. She had a late uh, advertising blitz attacking Olivia Chow and really trying to bolster her fortunes in this campaign. She seems to have lagged, but then maybe made a late push here. So that's one campaign to keep an eye on. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, Sean. And of course, elections and election nights are all about momentum. And as Sean was just saying, Anna Bailao certainly seems to have that right now. So let's turn to Meg Roberts. She is live for us tonight at Bailao's campaign. And Meg, the former deputy mayor, is going into tonight looking far stronger than I think she had looked throughout this campaign. How are people in that room feeling as we head into this evening? Well, absolutely. It's looking like a bit of a party here. You've got the music going now, of course, some hors d'oeuvres. And you also see all of that neon green that we've come to associate with her campaign. Supporters here saying they're feeling confident. They believe that she ran a, a really solid campaign. Uh, you know, they, they feel that um, she's really centered her campaign around this Toronto story, you know, that's very similar to others. For example, uh, you know, she... she uh, was uh, born in Portugal, moved here at the age of 15. Her father, uh, construction worker, it's a story that resonates with many. You see her here, she is uh, actually in the building, however, she's in a separate room watching with friends and family, and of course, they're hoping for a good outcome. Now, she has been down in the polls from Olivia Chow, but supporters here are confident that Baila will become Toronto's next mayor. And they're chalking that up to, you know, the amount of experience she has. She's been a councillor for 12 years. She has that deputy mayor experience. They're also, uh, you know, talking about how much support she's had. She, see, she has uh, received a number of big endorsements. That's including three former Toronto mayors, John Tory being one of them, a number of MPs and councillors. We saw McKelvey walk in not too long ago, uh, you know, so it's really going to depend on whether those Tory supporters have shown up today as well as, uh, you know, a number of union members. She was endorsed by two large unions to see if the pride of little Portugal can pull this off. Chris. All right, Meg, thank you very much. So we've just visited two rooms where there certainly seems like there's quite a lot of confidence within them. But for weeks, it had looked like if anybody was going to knock Chow off her game, it would be Mark Saunders. And Dale Manuktuk is tracking the former police chief's party tonight. Hey there, Dale. What are uh, people in that room telling you about what kind of party they're going to be having tonight? Victory or a nice try party? What do you think? Well, they're definitely hoping for a victory, Chris, and they feel a lot of momentum. There's about 60 to 70 of Mark's Honors supporters here right now at the Bistro on Avenue Road. It's been a, a little bit of a community hub here. A lot of people love the food. And interestingly enough, right beside me, a picture of John Tory with one of the business partners obviously triggered this election. Now, Mark Saunders, he did come here at about 6 o'clock. He did change his campaign strategy about two and a half weeks ago. If you remember when he came out, it was all about the priority of public safety. That was number one. And then two and a half weeks ago, based on those polling numbers, he shifted his strategy to a stop Olivia Chow strategy. These signs you see behind me, the original signs of his campaign, protect Toronto's future. Two and a half weeks ago, new ones started to appear that said Saunders is how you stop Chow. He made some bold moves including calling on other campaigns to support his, specifically Mitzi Hunter, Brad Bradford, and of course, Anthony Fury. So there's a little bit of trepidation here in the room about splitting the vote on the political right. Spoke to Mark Saunders earlier. He's feeling good. The campaign staff's feeling good. Supporters as well. We're going to see how it all shakes out, Chris. All right. Sounds good, Dale. We will talk to you again in just a few minutes, my friend. Now, in addition to our reporters out in the field, we also are lucky enough to have some smart, very plugged-in people joining us in studio as well to break down the results and help analyze all of this. Um, so Andrew Tumulty is a political campaigner and was the War Room Director for Mayor John Tory's 2018 re-election bid. Saman Tabasina Jad is the Acting Executive Director at Progress Toronto. And Shakir Chambers is a Conservative campaign strategist. Thank you to all of you for being with me tonight. 
Thank you. Thank you. So, Samantha, I want to talk to you first because Progress Toronto really endorsed Chow strongly and early, calling her the strongest progressive in the race. Why do you think it is that Olivia Chow has been connecting with voters and resonating with voters in a way that she has not in the past, particularly in 2014? Yeah, that's a really great question. So, um, Progress Toronto came out uh, a, a month and a bit ago in support of Olivia Chow as being our progressive champion. Um, we knocked on thousands of doors, asked, garnered in, um, feedback from a lot of different folks across our city in Topico and Scarborough, um, all, really um, in every corner in Nook and Cranny. Uh, and we were quite surprised to hear that even before Olivia Chow was, had really announced she was running, we were hearing her name come up over and over and over again. I think after two, uh, two uh, conservative mayors, both who left office in disgrace, people want someone who they can trust. People want someone who does what they say they do. And Olivia Chow really has a lot of integrity, and that's what we were hearing at the doors, and that's what we heard from our volunteers. And we're continuing to hear, to hear that uh, throughout the campaign. If anything, her support just went up and up and up. Um, and I think one thing that Torontonians are quite frustrated about are electing politicians and mayors who they can't trust, who say that they're going to make life more affordable, but they don't, who um, say that they're, you know, the boring, nice guy, and then they get kind of uh, caught in this scandal, um, having a relationship with a, a younger staffer um, and an ethical violation. So what I think they really want is someone like Olivia Chow, who has decades of experience, who knows... Um, who, who, who's, who, uh, who they, they know who she is, yeah. Well, we will have to see if that ends up being true. One thing that certainly was true throughout this race was that she really had a target on her back throughout the entire campaign. Shakira, I'm curious, as you were watching all of this, all of these candidates had a lot to say about Olivia Chow, but they seemed to struggle to try to catch the spotlight themselves. Why do you think that might have been? Yeah, I think a lot of candidates struggled to get traction because there were just so many of them, right? Mm -hmm. I think Olivia Chow benefited from being the candidate on the left, even endorsed by Progress Toronto, like having that kind of backing. But when you look at the center-right candidates like Mark Saunders and Anthony Fury, if you're a conservative, who do you vote for, right? Even look at their platforms. A lot of overlap there. It's a lot of confusion. If you're more in the center, you have Anna Bailao, you have a Brad Bradford, you have Mitzi Hunter. Who do you vote for? So I think Olivia Chow is benefiting from kind of that division on, on every other side of the political spectrum. And so no one ever got to get traction with their message, with their platform, again, because all that stuff overlaps. So right. just a lot of confusion for voters out there. Well, and I'm glad you brought up the endorsement because that could end up being a big storyline tonight as we watch these results come in live. And Progress Toronto had their endorsement out quite early. Doug Ford seemed to be kind of softly endorsing throughout much of the race, even though he said he wouldn't. Um, but John Tory had said he was going to stay out, and then just this past Wednesday came in and endorsed Anna Bai Lau. As someone who's worked closely with John Tory, do you think the campaign for Anna Bai Lau might be sitting there tonight wishing that that endorsement had come earlier? What do you think, Andrew? Yeah, I think there's probably a good chance that they were hoping that that might have come a little bit earlier. Um, I would imagine John Tory was hoping to stay out of it kind of as long as he could. Um, but I think what happened at the end of the day was that so many of his supporters uh, were working directly on Anna Bailao's campaign, volunteering for her, donors as well. And I think he saw that endorsement as an opportunity to, um, you know, give back to the team, to say thanks to the people that have supported him in the past by doing everything he could to try to get her elected. And do you think that what we're going to see tonight is a real appetite for change or more of a put trust and faith in John Tory? Because a lot of people have been talking about whether or not there should be a change in the city of Toronto. And then that endorsement came down. And the following day or the day after, polls really had shown a big boost for Anna Bailao. So what do you think? Is this a change election or not? Yeah, it's, it's tough to get a read on, right? Because uh, the early polls suggested that a lot of people didn't think that John Tory needed to step down, and then other polls suggested if he run, he would be running away with this election. Um, and at the same time, to their credit, there's the Chow campaign out there in front, obviously offering a very different vision of uh, the city than Mayor Tory. So we'll have to see how the polls come in tonight. Um, but I think, depending on the result, Calling this a change election is probably fair.
Yeah, Saman, what do you think? Because we did see a lot of uh, these kinds of indications, perhaps, that this might be a change election, especially when you looked at the number of candidates on the left that were getting pretty decent numbers in those public opinion polling throughout the campaign. So from your vantage point, what are you thinking about in terms of whether or not this is a change election? Yeah, absolutely. I think it is a change election with Olivia. When you look at the polls, you see Olivia Chow, you see Josh Matlow, you see Chloe Brown, you see Mitzi Hunter, all of whom I think have been running on progressive platforms. They're talking about raising revenue. They're talking about investing in services. They're not talking about sort of the same old, same old. Um, and they're polling very well, and you see some excitement happening. Uh, the voters are excited. I think with John Tory, um, his endorsement kind of, I think, was a double-edged sword. Uh, there were some people who just want, there were 102 people on the, on the ballot. They just wanted, like, some sort of indication of who to vote for. Mm -hmm. um, John Tory was a recognizable name. Okay, well, then, then now, okay, the, he's backing this person, so they felt some comfort towards that. But then we, you know, I also, we have a pretty large list and a lot of supporters, and some people who, who said that they did support John Tory in the past said that that endorsement came kind of um, maybe not, at, they weren't so keen about it because John Tory kind of threw us all into this election and he, and he said he was going to stay out and he came back in. And so I think some people might be actually quite disgruntled about that. Well, so we're getting an indication at this early stage in the night that people might actually have listened to that endorsement. We're seeing some of the results that are coming through right now. Didn't mean to cut you off, but this is a show focused around the results and analyzing it as well. So I want to get this information out there as well. With two thirds of the polls reporting, Anabai Lau has taken a lead and it seems to be growing as well. So I want to go back to Anabai Lau's campaign headquarters. That is where Meg Roberts is standing by. Hey there, Meg, what's the latest from where you're at? Well, you've got some uh, pretty excited people here, that's for sure. Lots of cheers already. Uh, we know that Anna Bailao has been endorsed by a, a number of uh, councillors, by former mayors. I'm here now with Jennifer McKelvey. Uh, so can you tell me, you know, uh, well, first of all, you know, why you decided to endorse Anna Bailao? Well, I worked with Anna Bailao in the last term of council. She is a wonderful person, and she did amazing things for affordable housing, and I want to see her keep doing those things as our mayor. If Bailao is elected tonight, what can Torontonians expect? They can expect somebody that will bring people together to solve complex problems. She's a real consensus builder. She'll build the relationships that we need. And importantly, I think she's going to negotiate a fair deal for Toronto with the provincial and the federal government. Talking about the provincial and federal governments, I know that she's calling for, you know, a, a bunch of, uh, you know, financial support. Do you think that with her experience, she's going to be able to get that done? I think that I barely heard the question with the cheers, um, but I think that if Anna wins tonight, it sends a strong signal to the provincial and the federal governments that we need a new deal for Toronto along the lines that she was talking about. So I'm hoping that she gets a strong showing and that mandate. Absolutely. As you can see, Chris, all of these excited people, you see all of that neon green that we've come to associate with their campaign. People are very optimistic here. Uh, we're going to throw it back to you. All right, Meg, thank you very much. So as Meg was just reporting there with uh, McKelvey, of course, Anna Bai Lau is uh, quite a bit ahead and growing at this point, and Angelina King is tracking those results for us. Hey there, Angelina, what are you seeing? Well, I've been refreshing and refreshing, Chris, quite quickly. We are seeing these early results coming in now. It's looking like it's going to be a two-woman race. Anna Bailau is leading with around 37% of the vote. She has around 7,000 votes over Olivia Chow, who's at about 36%. So just the tightest and tightest of margins. Anna Bailau is winning in Toronto, St. Paul. So that's Josh Matlow's ward. He's the current city councillor there, also running for mayor. She's doing well in Eglinton Lawrence. Olivia Chow, not a big surprise, doing well in downtown. In some wards, in Scarborough as well, and then trailing in quite a distant third. Mark Saunders, he's at under 10% right now. So a big margin between him and our two front runners right now. This is with uh, around 600 of the nearly 1,500 polls reporting. So keeping our eye close on this really, really tight race, and I'll keep crunching the numbers and send it back to you for now. All right, thank you, mathematician Angelina King. We appreciate all that crunching. Andrew, I'm curious, when we see kind of neck and neck, Bailao pulling out ahead there, 
maybe it wasn't too late, that endorsement. What do you think? Might not have been. I think, you know, when you look at the bylaw campaign throughout this, they've looked very well organized in the way that they've rolled out a series of endorsements, not mm. just from um, former Mayor Tory, but from the unions, from a lot of councillors. You know, right. that's something that might be the difference there, because each of those councillors is going to have their own dedicated team of support, of volunteers in their community that they might have been able to get out the door to help pull vote for, uh, for Anna Bylaw. Yeah, that's correct. Nine councillors endorsing Anna Bai Lau in this campaign. Talk to us, Shakir, a little bit about how big a deal that can be when a local councillor is endorsing somebody for mayor and that, that ground game and that door knocking campaign. I think local endorsements are a little overstated, but I think okay. a, a John Tory, I think a, a Doug Ford does gain some traction. And I would say, in, in relative to Olivia Chow, I think they ran a good campaign and a front runner campaign, but I think there are a lot of voters out there that probably were listening to, like, anybody but Chow, and they finally saw in those last few days, you know, Anna Bailao being that one candidate that could possibly be the one to beat Olivia, uh, Olivia Chow, I think you're seeing that vote coalesce Anna Bailao. We'll see what the end result is, but I think a lot of the folks who didn't want Olivia Chow to win just said, she's the only person that could possibly do this, so let's give her our vote and see what happens. Well, and when you talk about a big endorsement, like a John Tory, Doug Ford would be viewed as a big endorsement as well. Certainly, uh, he was very clear. Mark Saunders was his guy. He was at Ford Nation, the, the festival there, just the other day. And yet, here we're seeing him down around 8%, a very distant third. So what is that saying about Doug Ford's endorsement or the candidate was just not impressing people. What do you think? I think you should look at the provincial map, right? Doug Ford's support is not downtown Toronto. Doug Ford's support is Mississauga, Brampton, rural Ontario. So his support, his uh, endorsement only goes so far. John Tory is Toronto. So I think he has a little more traction in terms of who he speaks to, who's going to listen to him. Uh, if this was a, a race in Mississauga or Brampton, you know, Saunders might do pretty good, but it is Toronto and that's not Doug Ford's like audience and crowd. So, man, what do you think? Because, I mean, one might think that Doug Ford would do well at least with an endorsement in Etobicoke, and it seems like Anna Bailao is doing pretty well when she looks across the city at this point. So what do you think about that Ford endorsement? Yeah, I absolutely agree. I don't think that... Um, I think that John Tory's name carries a lot more name recognition, and I think people do respect him ultimately. Um, and I think that with, with Doug Ford... Uh, like, he has, he has won quite a bit of, um, he has quite a number of seats in Toronto, but of course, I, I do think that, uh, that those, those, um, those polls or those wards might not have as big as voter turnout, so I think that there is some, um, tension there, um, so I do think that, uh, I agree with Shakir as well, that, uh, Anna Bailao was kind of identified as the, was identified as the Olivia Chow, anti-Olivia Chow vote, mm -hmm. um, especially the last couple of polls um, from Sunday, you really did see that. Um, so I can see how, how that anti-Olivia Chow vote really coalesced around her. And I, and I do think Tory's name carries a lot more than Ford's. Well, and it's certainly turning out to be quite a dramatic evening here. We're seeing just 4,500 votes are separating first and second place. Chow seems to be potentially closing in on Bai Lau's lead, but still, that's pretty tight here either way. And certainly, the Olivia Chow campaign would not have anticipated this would have been the results when you looked at the public opinion polling. Andrew, I'm curious what that might have said about their campaign generally, because a lot of people had been talking about how they were running that classic front-runner campaign. Don't promise too much, kind of don't screw up, just keep it going. Do you think that was a mistake? Might they be looking back and, and wondering if they should have done it differently? No, I, I don't think so. I think looking at the numbers, I don't, I don't think they had a lot of options other than, than running that kind of a classic front-runner campaign. And, and I'll give them full credit for it, too, because that's a challenging campaign to run um, if you're not the incumbent or in a situation like this where there is no incumbent. You know, I think it's, I think it's fair to say that as, as a, a general kind of... Um, assessment, Olivia Chow's uh, base is, 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 are the sort of, sort of voters that are ready for big change, bold change, and, and putting a front-runner campaign out to those types of voters is challenging. Um, they did, a, I think, a good job doing it. I don't think they had a choice looking at the numbers, and so we'll, we'll see how it ends up at the end of the night. Okay, and with this race being as close as it is, these two women neck and neck here in uh, the election results that we are seeing. I want to go now to Ali Shiasan, who is, of course, live for us at Olivia Chow's campaign headquarters, and she also has a counselor with her there. Hey there, Ali. Hey, Chris. That's right. Here I am with city councillor Osma Malik. Now, I have to ask you, you endorsed Olivia Chow early on. What made her the right candidate for you and perhaps your constituents? Well, I've known Olivia for many years. And for me, the number one thing was that she has 
proven that she can work collaboratively and actually deliver policies and concrete solutions to the challenges that Torontonians face. She did that when she was a school board trustee, when she was a city councillor, when she was a member of, provincial, of, of federal parliament. And now to be able to do that as, as mayor is what excited me. And what I was hearing on the ground from folks who connected with her story and her struggles who connect with her experience of living in the city in a very real way. When she talks about the issues around public services, transit, finding affordable housing, that is really real. And the solutions that she's presenting come through hard-earned experience and also the smarts to get it done. So I wonder, considering you were elected city councillor when John Tory was elected for that uh, fateful third term, so you had experience working with him as mayor. I wonder for you, what did you take away from that in terms of what you want in the working relationship with the next mayor, regardless of who it is? Absolutely. The most important uh, thing for me, excuse me, is, uh, is a mayor who's able to work across the political spectrum, who's able to work collaboratively and work as colleagues with councillors for the solutions that we need. And we need a mayor who is going to be the strongest advocate and organizer to make sure that we get our fair share from the provincial and federal governments when we've seen that and that was not uh, done with the same vigor that we needed in previous terms. What we're seeing the challenges right now in the city are 12 plus years in the making and with Olivia Chow we know we're going to get a champion to make sure that we get the best outcomes for Torontonians from every level of government. So. Well, certainly everybody in the room here believes that. Lots of excitement <laughs> here. Um, I have to ask though as well, since you are a downtown councillor, how well do you think she resonated with uh, constituents or voters outside of the court? What we saw, and I think what you can hear tonight, is an excitement in every corner of Toronto. I think what's really important is that she had endorsements from council from people who represented a new generation of elected representatives and experience from across the city from Etobicoke to Scarborough and we saw the way people responded to her in every part of the city where she grew up in her first apartment in St. Jamestown in downtown Toronto and from one end of the city to the other uh, people are connecting with Olivia's story because she is one of them. So we have been starting to see some polling results come in and we were seeing um, Anna Bailau edging a little bit further ahead than Olivia. Are you concerned about that? You know what, for me, I, I know um, and having been through this many times, we can't discern, d discern the outcome until every vote is counted. And what I see is a tremendous amount of enthusiasm from Torontonians to get out to, to make sure that we land uh, a mayor in, the, in that seat and to have a little bit more certainty. Uh, my hope is that Olivia's um, uh, message, the way that she's been able to rise above a lot of the noise to actually reach people, is what we see delivered tonight. So. Rising above the noise, tremendous amount of enthusiasm. All of that is happening in this, this room. This is the good noise. This is the this is the joyful noise. Thank yeah, you so yeah. much, Osma, for Thank taking the time so to chat with us. Appreciate it. Back to you, Chris. All right, Ali, thank you so much. And of course, all of that noise is because we've now seen a bit of a shift in this very tight race for mayor of Toronto. Olivia Chow has taken over the lead, and that is why you are hearing so much applause there in that room. Angelina King has a little bit of a preview here of how tight this race is and how Chow has taken the lead. Angelina, what are we seeing? The tightest of tights just took the lead I literally was ready to go, refreshed, everything has changed, that's what happens when we're covering elections. So about 8,000 votes for Olivia Chow over Anna Bailau, it's virtually a 2% uh, spread right there, so it's such a tight race. If you didn't think your vote mattered, it sure could matter tonight. Olivia Chow still doing well in downtown, no surprise there, of course, that's uh, where she was a city councillor back in the 90s, where she spent time uh, as an MP. But we are still waiting for some uh, polls to come out of Spadina, Fort York. I think around 13 polls. So there still is a chance that that spread could go uh, a, a little bit wider. Um, and I do want to just make a quick mention when it comes to Mark Saunders. Um, support has virtually collapsed. He's at about 8% right now. So this is with more than 1,200 of the nearly 1,500 polls reporting. Such a tight race. Keeping our eye on everything really close. And... Uh, 
I'm going to keep doing the math, Chris. I'll send it back to you for now. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Angelina. And close, no kidding. Um, when we look at the fact, though, that Chow has taken over this lead, Saman, I want to go to you right away. What's your reaction? I mean, you seemed pretty confident when we were speaking off the top. What do you think about this jostling for first at this point? I mean, I'm on the edge of my seat. <laughs> I can see. Uh, I yeah, love it. You um, sat right yes, up. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. And um, I think that there were, like, as pro at Progress Toronto, uh, we really work we can't deliver an entire victory for a candidate. So from my perspective, from Progress Toronto's perspective, I do think we, we picked the right person. Um, because if you know, if there wasn't a conservative version of our of our like conservative Toronto, um, and and then we were we had packed the candidate like Saunders, I think they would be really kicking themselves right now. Um, kind of that kind of thing. So I, I do feel kind of confident about that. I do, I don't know where the spread is in terms of the polls. Um, but I, I do, I, I am confident on the ground game of Olivia Chow's campaign. Um, I'm also confident because uh, I know that our team was really pushing out and, and, and trying to get out the vote from our base. So they're, they're, uh, there really is still a path to victory for Olivia Chow. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm on the edge of my seat because I'm excited about our city having a change. Really and Samantha, frankly. if you are on the edge of your seat, Shakir, your body language <laughs> yeah, is chilling chill. right chilling. back there. It is the exact <laughs> opposite. I love it. You're kind of a chill guy. I can get that sense already. But, I mean, what, what are you thinking about in terms of looking at this and the conservative vote in the city of Toronto right now? Saunders around 8%, Fury around 5%. As uh, we were just saying, that is quite a collapse for the, the right of center vote. What do you think is happening? Were people staying home? Were they not motivated? What's going on? I think it speaks to what I said earlier. I think the conservatives were looking at who can stop Olivia Chow. And I think they think it's Anna Bailao, right? So all of that vote is going to her. Um, it had nothing to do with Doug Ford's endorsement of Sanders, nothing to do with Fury himself. Like, he did a good campaign, was searching towards the end. But I think if you are a conservative, respectfully, you don't want to see Anna, Olivia Chow as the next mayor. So what are you going to do? find someone to coalesce around. I think Anna Bailao has become that candidate. We'll see how it turns out. Chow's looking pretty good right now, but um, they're abandoning everybody else and saying Bailao is the only person who can stop her. Let's just put our votes behind and, her. And just to add on to that, from our perspective, from um, we did run, we did, like, from Progress Toronto's perspective, we were saying the only person that can beat Anna Bailao right now is Olivia Chow. So there was a, coales a coalescing of the progressive vote around Olivia Chow as well. And I would add, I think, what you said to Andrew earlier, uh, John Tory, whoever it was, has to be kicking themselves, right? Because if John Tory's endorsement had an effect to like do this kind of surge, right. imagine if you did it two weeks ago. Well, and that actually brings me to my next question, because that endorsement came after the advance vote, and we're still waiting. The, the advance vote uh, polls come in last, so that could change things here as we look at the results once those get factored in. Do you think that kicking themselves should have done it before the advance voting, perhaps? Yeah, absolutely. I think, again, given this, the bump we saw in the polls, I feel like John Tory did have an impact. Uh, if it would have happened before advanced polling, we'll see how that turns out. But I was chatting with Andrew before the panel. I think a lot of the advanced polling is actually going to go to Olivia Chow uh, at the end too. of the day. So I'm not sure how sure, how sure it's going to uh, look for Anna Bailao moving forward. Yeah, Andrew, what do you think about where the advanced vote might go? Yeah, I, I got to think most of that's probably uh, going to be looking good for Olivia Chow. Advanced voters are, are highly motivated. Um, they're the ones that are looking to get out there. You know, they're the, the eager beavers of election, <laughs> day, if you will. And, and in a race like this, you know, her supporters have seen a real opportunity. So I wouldn't be surprised to see that that's where most of the enthusiasm was going in the advance vote. Well, and to that point right now, I am seeing that Olivia Chow is stretching the lead that she had. Still, uh, polls to report that that is for sure, but things are definitely looking quite good for Olivia Chow. So I guess if we're starting to kind of see how well she's doing in that lead stretching, how would Olivia Chow as mayor interact with the other levels of government? Shakir, I mean, especially after we saw Doug Ford talking on the uh, campaign trail that she would be a, quote, unmitigated disaster. I mean, not kind words, and now they might have to be dealing with each other going forward. So how is that relationship going to work? I think one thing for Doug Ford, he's shown he's not an ideologue, right? He came in, had animosity with John Tory, they worked together. Came in, had animosity with uh, Justin Trudeau, they worked together. I think Doug Ford's smart enough to play politics, but pragmatic enough to get results. And so I think if Olivia Chow becomes mayor and it was going to work with Doug in a non-ideological fashion, mm -hmm. they'll get things done. But I think if they both go in and get into their corners, it's going to be a rough time for Toronto moving forward. All right. Well, speaking about Doug Ford and the endorsement that he laid out in this campaign certainly was for Mark Saunders. And I want to go back to Mark Saunders' campaign. That is where Dale Manukduk is standing live for us. And he has a guest. Hey there, Dale. How are people in that room reacting given how poorly Mark Saunders is doing tonight? 
Well, Chris, there's probably nobody better to ask than his co-campaign manager, Larissa Waller. Larissa, what happened tonight? You know, at the doors today, we were, we were you know, knocking our identified supporters, and a lot of them were telling us they were going to vote for Anna Bailao in an effort to stop Chow. You know, I wish they would have voted for us in an effort to stop Chow, but that's obviously not what happened. So we'll see, what, we'll see how, uh, how the cookie crumbles tonight to see who will become the mayor. Um, I think that the John Tory endorsement obviously um, gave gave Baila the, the bump she needed. Uh, and with that endorsement obviously came the John Tory election machine. And, uh, and it seems to have worked for her tonight. Why is the John Tory election machine different from what happened with Premier Doug Ford's endorsement? Yeah, you know what? I think with, with the John Tory machine, it, it came with a full team of people. The Premier was asked who he's going to vote for. He said he's going to vote for Mark. And, you know, he, he, he obviously supports Mark, but it didn't come with that whole mayoral election team. That, uh, that John Tory had. Um, and, you know, they're very, very good at it. And obviously tonight, uh, that's paying off. we got to ask, what's next for Mark Saunders? Yeah, you know what? I'm going to let Mark speak for Mark. Um, but Mark's had a career of public service. Um, he cares deeply about this city. He cares very much about the crime and disorder happening on our streets and in our subways. And I, I hope that he continues to serve the city in some way, but I'll let him speak for himself. Now, Mark ran on very different things than uh, who's currently leading is Olivia Chow. What do you think about this two-horse race between Chow and Anna Bailao right now? Uh, it's fascinating. <laughs> so so I, I'm fascinated by that. I think if we look at just pure platforms, um, Olivia and Mark kind of presented sort of two polar opposites. Uh, Mark is very much focused on public safety, uh, affordability, congestion. Uh, Olivia Chow presented a different version. Um, and I think that the people of Toronto made a decision tonight. And uh, the one thing I will say is that everybody who ran for mayor, including Ms. Chow, including Ms. Bailo, love our city. Um, and I think it's exciting that the top three candidates are all immigrants. The top two candidates are women. So, you know, I think Toronto will be well served by whoever becomes mayor tonight. Well, it's a graceful response from Larissa Waller, Mark Saunders, co-campaign manager. Uh, obviously not the result that anybody here at the Bistro on Avenue Road wanted to see. But as you heard, it looks like Toronto's going to have a woman mayor for the very first time. Yeah, graceful indeed, and it's nice to see grace on election nights as this all unfolds so fast and furious. It can be tough to stomach sometimes when you're on a losing campaign like that, especially when it's a difficult loss as well. But we are certainly seeing the front two candidates very tight, possibly a lot tighter than many people were expecting leading into this. Angelina King is back with another look at some of the results. Angelina, what is the latest? Yeah, things are tight and not what we were kind of seeing in the polls uh, in the weeks leading up, but hey, that's how things go. Olivia Chow's lead is growing a little bit, though. There is still a lot of polls to report, but it's looking good for her at this moment. Again, things keep changing so quickly, but it's about a two percentage point difference between Olivia Chow and Anna Bailao. And I'm going to read out the exact percents right now because they really do keep changing. So Olivia Chow right now with 36.55% of the vote share. Anna Bailao, 33.80. About a 14,000 vote spread between Olivia Chow and Anna, Bala Anna Bailao. And it's always worth mentioning, we're uh, more than 1,300 of the nearly 1,500 polls are reporting. I want to talk about a bit of a battleground that's starting to take shape. We're seeing that play out in Scarborough. So Scarborough is made up of six wards. Right now it's looking like Anna Baila was pulling ahead in four of them. Olivia Chow with two, but those numbers are coming in quickly. There's still some polls to report. So again, that could change within minutes. So check back within minutes if you want. I'll be here. All right, you better believe we will check back in again with you. Thank you, Angelina. I want to pick up on that battleground Scarborough storyline because it's certainly an interesting one when you're looking at the city writ large and where the candidates end up doing well and not. Um, Andrew, I'll come to you on this. Why do you think we're seeing a tight race there in Scarborough specifically? Well, I, there's a there's a broad sort of diversity to Scarborough uh, in terms of the population, not just you know where people are from, um, but in in ages and education and income. Like I've gone door knocking in Scarborough. I used to live in a Scarborough riding as well, um, and I think that's what a lot of people miss, right? You know that it's the biggest part of the city, um, and when you look at what uh, that means in terms of the population, all kinds of different points of view. You know, if there's one part of Toronto that's hard to paint with a brush, it's, it's Scarborough for sure. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Well, and if it seems as though 
whichever of these two ladies becomes mayor tonight, whichever one does, how they will lead their campaign and their administration going forward if Scarborough is the one that seems to have given them the keys to the city, so to speak. Saman, how do you think that's going to adjust the ways in which they govern the city? Yeah, and I, and I think, um, just to pick up where Andrew left off, um, both Olivia Chow and Anna Bailao had pretty strong Scarborough campaigns. They both had dedicated Scarborough campaign offices. Um, so I think they were really vying for that Scarborough vote. Um, and I think in the administration, I think a lot um, the Scarborough voters are, are quite honestly, probably a little bit peeved at the city in a lot of ways. The Scarborough RT gets shutting down. Um, a lot of people have are dealing with long commutes. So I think with, um, what we'll see in either administration is kind of a, an effort to consolidate that support, especially since um, the next election is only three years away. That change is going to be hard. Whoever is going to be elected is going to have a difficult time um, in kind of getting the ducks, their ducks all in a row um, and getting results for any constituency. So I think they're going to they're going to have to be strategic. Well, and the other thing that Mark Saunders campaign manager was talking about and highlighting was the fact that the two top finishers are both women, both immigrants, top three, in fact, immigrants to this country. Simon, what do you think that that says about where we're at as a city right now? It's certainly not been the case in elections past. Yeah. And um, as a woman who's an immigrant uh, and who moved to, to Canada when I was young, um, it's really exciting. And I think what we're, we're also seeing is, is the finally, we're, we saw that in 2022 with election, the, the municipal election where a slew of new can, uh, candidates Certainly. were elected, um, very diverse, really representative of, of, city, of the city. Um, and now we're going to see it in, in the mayor's office. That's really exciting to see um, City Hall start to reflect the diversity of Toronto. Okay, perfect. Well, and as I was saying earlier, this night is a lot about the results, and I want to go back to uh, Meg Roberts, who is out at Anna Bailao's headquarters, and she has a guest. Meg, things are pretty close, and it looks like Battleground Scarborough. How are people feeling in this room now? A bit different than the last time I touched base with you, I assume. Yeah, absolutely. The mood has definitely changed a little bit in here now, although you're still hearing those Go Anna cheers. As you can see, there's a number of supporters here. I mean, you can't even walk through the crowd, so still staying optimistic, absolutely. I am here with Taylor Deasley. She's a member of Anna Bailao's campaign team. Uh, Anna, what are you making of the polls so far? I think we're seeing how much support Anna has that's widespread across the city from Scarborough to North York to Etobicoke to the downtown. It's really reflecting how many people are resonating with Anna's message, showing up to the polls and voting for the vision of Toronto that they want, which it seems like they're very supportive of Anna and Anna's vision. Uh, you know, obviously now uh, we're seeing the polls change a little bit. Uh, you know, Olivia Chow taking that first place. Are you still feeling optimistic? How's the team doing? We're feeling optimistic. As you can see in this room, we have hundreds of supporters. We've had hundreds of supporters out on the ground knocking on doors all day long, all weekend long. We have we have visited 150,000 doors this past week alone, 700,000 since the beginning of the campaign. We've made over 2 million calls. We have huge momentum, a lot of enthusiasm, and we have been having a great time interacting with voters. Absolutely. You know, uh, there will be a female mayor, that's for sure. You know, what do you make of that? I think it's amazing. I think it's about time. I mean, we have had female mayors uh, for, you know, before Toronto was a mega city, Barbara Hall, um, who is endorsing Anna. Um, but this is a big deal to have a female mayor as the biggest of the biggest city in the country and one of the biggest cities in North America. It's huge. Thank you so much for your time, Taylor. You. Yeah, Thank so you. as she mentioned, you know, the optimis optimism is still there. I mean, it really is a, a bit of a party here. Like I said, it is packed wall to wall, so we're just going to have to stay tuned uh, to see how this ends, Chris. Yeah, we certainly will be uh, checking back in with you again. Meg, thank you so much for that look live at what's going on at Anna Bai Lau's campaign. And of course, it's not just these two front runners that we are keeping a close eye on. We're looking at several of the campaigns tonight. And I want to take you now live to Anthony Fury's campaign headquarters. He certainly had had a lot of momentum, or at least said that he did. And at this stage, we are seeing that he's around 5% support certainly nowhere near what those popular opinion polls were saying he might be at as we headed into tonight. We are certainly seeing a collapse of the conservative vote as we watch these results come in. And interesting to point out that Fury is not even winning in his own ward. 
So certainly another storyline to continue tracking. And I also want to take a look at Josh Matlow's campaign headquarters tonight. Similar, you're not seeing as much energy as you were seeing at Bailao or at Chow's campaign headquarters. Josh Matlow also having a difficult night here. Uh, under Fury, around 5% as well. And Josh Matlow, interestingly, also not able to uh, be ahead in his own <coughs> ward either. So certainly a lot to watch as we see all of these campaigns. I think it was you, Shakir, who was talking about the sheer number of campaigns and how that vote would shake down through all of them. And that really led a lot of us to know that a fact of tonight was going to be that whoever won this thing might have a low vote share. At the end of the day, it could be the lowest in Toronto's history. John Tory currently has that with 40% back when he won in 2014. But perhaps tonight we could be making history on that front as well. How does that impact the way in which a mayor is able to operate when they go to City Hall with a historically low vote margin? Yeah, I think we still have some votes to count. I think Olivia Chow is at 37%, so she has can probably go a bit higher. But I think if you don't have a strong mandate, I mean, you're going to get challenged by a lot of councillors and a lot of your ideas. Mm -hmm. If you're going to the province or the federal government asking for funding or asking for a certain project, they'll look at you and probably say you don't have the mandate to do this. So I think it just puts a dent in your agenda in terms of what you can advance moving forward. So we'll see what Olivia Chow ends up with. But I think ultimately, we were talking about working with Doug Ford, for example, and you brought up transit. I think if you're looking at Scarborough, that Scarborough writing, Doug Ford is big on transit, uh, the, the Sar Scarborough subway extension. He wants a lot of things done there. So if Olivia Chow, Chow does win, there are definitely areas of cooperation that they can work on to move together, given what I've seen in Olivia Chow's platform. We'll just see if they can come to the same kind of funding arrangements, same kind of projects that they want to see done. We'll have to see how this plays out as we move forward. Okay. And, Andrew, what do you think? How does that impact um, the administration of a mayor when they head there with a relatively small vote margin? I think what's going to be interesting here, and I think one of the challenges, whether it's, it's Chow or Bailao, frankly, is that the mayor's being elected uh, in a standalone election tonight, right? In, in other municipal elections, a, a slate of councillors was elected at the same time. Um, I know that in 2018, John Tory won more votes than all the council winners put together. So like that, regardless of where the vote share is, that kind of momentum, that kind of support across the city gives the mayor a, a strong mandate. Mm -hmm. Coming into this election, you're coming into a council that's already been elected. And you're going to have to look at where you have opportunities um, to, to get the vote through. You know, Olivia Chow has said that she wasn't interested in using the strong mayor powers. So she's going to need 13 out of 25 votes to get anything done and it, it's, it's going to be tricky uh, I think if she's got a lower turnout and was elected separately from council to find that support sometimes. Okay and I want to break in now with a big update in our show this evening. CBC's decision desk has looked at the numbers and is ready to make the major projection of the evening. Olivia Chow will replace John Tory as the 66th mayor of Toronto. First elected to city politics in 1985, Chow served as a school board trustee, then a city councillor for almost 15 years before going federal. After serving as an NDP MP for Trinity Spadina for nearly a decade, she resigned her federal seat to run for mayor of Toronto back in 2014. And despite starting out as the front runner back then, she ultimately lost. You fast forward now, and my goodness, what a different scene we are seeing tonight. The crowd says it all. They are certainly very excited to see the 66-year-old politician and activist becoming the 66th mayor of our city as well. And Ali Shiasan is there right in the thick of that big party tonight. Hey there, Ali. How are people reacting to this breaking news? Olivia Chow, mayor-elect. Well, Chris, just have a look and have a listen to the atmosphere in the room. I think they know. And I'm actually standing here with Gil Penalosa while uh, we were standing here getting ready. You had a look at the results as well. You were at one point in the in the mayoralty race before you threw your support behind Olivia. I need to get your reaction. We're projecting she's been the uh, the mayor elect now. I'm so happy, so happy not only for Olivia but for Toronto. It was never about me. It was about Toronto. On October, I had 100,000 votes. If I had run this time, and let's say I didn't get the 100,000, I had gotten 30,000, maybe Olivia would have lost. So I said, it's not about me, it's about Toronto, and I supported her. When I endorsed her in April, she had 22, Madlow 22, and Saunders 20. The next week, she had eight more, and the following week, 15 more. She ran an amazing campaign. She, she really connected with the citizens. The citizens really loved what she was saying. 
she won as a Toronto very different from the last 12 years. She's going to be the first mayor since amalgamation, the first mayor in 25 years that is a woman. She's going to be the first one that is an immigrant. She's going to be the first one that is a visible minority. But also, she has a lot of experience. She was twice elected as trustee, school trustee. She was twice elected as councillor and once as MP. So I think that Toronto is going to have a very different look and feel and a lot of very different priorities. So this was always going to be a change election. And with Olivia Chow now as the mayor-elect, do you think that is going to be the case? We're going to see a lot of change. And what will that change look like at City Hall? Well, I think that a lot of the priorities. I think that it will never happen again what happened in February, that council voted against having warming places for the homeless people. When we have a city with $16 billion of budget, it's totally unacceptable not to have a warming place for people that are on house. So that's going to be, I think it's going to be safer for people walking, for people cycling. We're going to have a real vision zero. I think that also the parks is going to be different. I think that everything that is free, which is what makes the city. I mean, we should evaluate the cities by how do we treat the most vulnerable people. And the most vulnerable by age are these children and the elderly, but also everyone that is poor, people with disabilities, people of racial minorities, ethnic minorities. And I think those are going to be Olivia's priorities. And I think there's a lot of councillors, especially the new ones, that are going to get on board and they're going to create a great team. And I think that a lot of the city staff are good. Maybe not some of the top, but I think overall there's a lot of good people. And I think that we are up for a very different city. So you're saying that she is up for the challenge because, of course, there are a lot of challenges that she will be taking over in her portfolio as mayor, right? So you're saying she's up for this challenge and she's the one. Yeah, it's not going to be easy. John Tory was a disaster. After eight years, we have a huge housing crisis. We have a financial crisis. The, the public transit is unsafe. I mean, any indicator is bad. So she's going to have to deal with an enormous challenge. But I think she's up to it, and the team around her is up to it. Safe to say, Olivia Chow is ready, and all of her voters are ready to see her in action. Gil Penulosa, thank you so much, and enjoy the night. Oh, thank you. This is amazing. Back to you, Chris. All right, Ali Shiasan, thank you so much. At Olivia Chow, mayor-elect, her campaign party there, and Angelina King has been tracking all of the results for us all night. Let's look at the nuts and bolts and how Olivia Chow won this. Sure, yeah. So right now we're seeing Olivia Chow with about 29,000 votes over Anna Bailao ahead of the pack with 37.1% of the vote share. Anna Bailao behind her with 32%. This is with nearly 1,400 of the nearly 1,500 polls reporting. So enough for our decision desk to make that projection. Olivia Chow to become the 66th mayor of Toronto. Clearly her progressive campaign really resonating with voters tonight, particularly in all of downtown not a big surprise there she also did well in many parts of Scarborough helping make up that 37.1 percent of the vote share that's a number we'll be watching right now that's the lowest margin of victory since amalgamation but just by a tiny little bit it belongs to John Tory at 40 percent in 2014 but um so we will be keeping our eye to see how strong her mandate will be but that's a story for another day. Tonight, it's Mayor-elect Olivia Chow. Chris? Yeah, we're too busy dining out on this Chow storyline. And Sean, I want to hear from you. What is your reaction? She was leading in the polls all throughout this thing. It was looking very, very close there for a few minutes. And yet, Olivia Chow pulls out the win tonight. Wow. I mean, a lot of drama tonight. And I don't know if we would have called it based on all of the polling that we saw coming into the night. And I guess that's why we heard all the caveats about the polling. There was blind spots. There were things that perhaps they weren't picking up. And then, of course, came that last minute endorsement from Mayor John Tory, or former Mayor John Tory, I should say. You know, I think that we are in store for a lot of change at City Hall under Olivia Chow. She's promised some very big things. And uh, it's going to be a really different direction now, right? Headed, mm -hmm. uh, headed in a really different direction. A different direction, especially when you look at how the right of center vote went and how much it collapsed. Saunders so low with around 8%. He certainly had been polling throughout the campaign much, much higher. Right. What do you think is behind that collapse of the right of center vote? You know, I think that's something that we're going to be trying to figure out over the next 
you know, days and weeks ahead to, to really truly understand what happened to that right of center vote. It, it's clear that it did not land with Mark Saunders or Anthony Fury or even Brad Bradford, who is finishing, it would seem, well down the ticket. In fact, a lot of the, those top tier candidates that we thought were polling in and around the 10 percent mark, they underperformed pretty dramatically. And those votes coalesced around Anna Bailao and Olivia Chow, who has pulled it out. Exactly. OK. Olivia Chow certainly pulling it out, but as you mentioned, Anna Bailao did capture quite a lot of that support, surprisingly perhaps, considering how she'd been doing through much of this campaign. Meg Roberts is uh, joining us again live. Hey there, Meg, how are people feeling now that we've uh, laid out this breaking news that Olivia Chow will be the next mayor of Toronto? Yeah, absolutely. It's obviously not the outcome so many supporters here wanted to see, obviously. Uh, but, you know, we're still hearing cheers. It's still, like I said earlier, it's, it's a pretty big party here uh, still. Uh, we've heard that Bailao will be making an announcement later. She'll be mingling with some folks here. Uh, she won't be speaking with reporters. That's what we've heard. Uh, and I'm going to bring in now Carmen Wong, who is a part of her uh, uh, campaign team there. Uh, Carmen, on behalf of the staff, I guess, what's running through your head right now? Obviously, we're disappointed uh, in the result, but uh, we want to congratulate Olivia Chow and her campaign, and also to all the candidates and all the people who put their name forward in this campaign. It was hard fought. Anna's a great candidate. She had a vision for the city that a lot of people agreed with, as you can see from the popular vote. And unfortunately, Olivia Chow just did a bit better this time, but congratulations to her and to all the other campaigns. What do you think, you know, went wrong here? There was a number of endorsements from, uh, you know, the, the former mayors and councillors. Where do you think it could have gone better? Well, you know, I think ultimately it was a choice that voters made and they decided they wanted Olivia Chow's vision more than Anna's. Anna, and you're going to see her speak now, so let's go to her. Yeah, absolutely. As you can see, Anna Bailao taking the stage now. to be here with so many friends. I'm seeing so many family members, so many that have been with me for so many years and believed in this campaign. Thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. I love you too. <laughs> neighborhoods of communities stitched together by so many cultures, so many languages, and incredible people. On our own, we are just individuals, but together we are communities and neighborhoods making up this amazing city we call home. This amazing city I've called home since I was 15. And it's up to each one of us to be good neighbors, to come together and help build our city each and every day. The results of tonight are not what we were hoping for. I know, I know. <laughs> but, but after speaking... <laughs> but after speaking... After speaking with tens of thousands of residents in every corner of Toronto, I'm so optimistic about the future of our city. And I want to sincerely, sincerely congratulate Olivia Chow on her win tonight. Congratulations, Olivia. Our city faces 
Our city faces many challenges, and I wish you all the best as you navigate these challenges alongside City Council and working with other governments. In our city's most challenges moments, Toronto has always had a way of coming together to find solutions. And now with Olivia Chow as our next mayor, it's time to come together, to be there for one another, and to support solutions that fix our services, that build housing, and make life more affordable to all the residents of Toronto. We all know this was a long and unexpected campaign, and I would also like to congratulate the other candidates many of whom who I consider friends. So thank you and congratulations to Mark Saunders, Mitzi Hunter, Brad Bradford, Josh Matlow, Chloe Brown, Anthony Fury, and to all the 102 candidates, including Molly the dog, <laughs> who, who were brave and bold. You know, everybody was brave and bold to put their name on the ballot. Campaigns are never easy, but nothing worth doing is ever easy. Isn't that right? That's right. So no one knows more, no one knows that more than the thousands of volunteers in every campaign, which brings me to our amazing and incredible team. So what can I say in quoting our very own Ferd, best ever! bumblebees and zesty yellow. Yes, zesty yellow is the color forever and to stay. Thank you, thank you to all the bumblebees from the bottom of my heart. For my entire life, I will be grateful for every minute you put into this campaign. And thank you, it's just been incredible. We visited a record setting 700,000 doors. That is right, 700,000 doors. Just, just this week alone, in one week, we've been to 150,000 doors. This team have been out there. And we made over two million calls, never getting this courage, never getting this courage by any poll, never getting this courage by every comment, because we knew, we believed in our message, we believed that our team could get it out there, the message of building housing, of fixing service, and of making life more affordable. We took it to Scarborough, we took it to North York, we took it to Etobicoke, and we took it to downtown. And people listen with the amount of votes that we got tonight. They heard our message. You, you poured your hard work, your aspirations, your grit, and your optimism in your campaign. So thank you for every call, every post, especially my sister, I heard she was pretty good. I, I was not allowed to be out. <laughs> I, was, I was not allowed to be on social media, so I just hear rumors here and there. So. so for every conversation that you had with your neighbors, with your friends, thank you. And friends that you dragged along to E-Day to be knocking on doors because I ran with so many of you and met some of your family members. Thank you. Thank you for every single step that you walked, reaching voters at their doorsteps. Thank you every event that you helped organize. Thank you for your, the message that you shared uh, in our campaign message. Thank you for every dollar donated. Thank you for every dollar raised. Former we Deputy Mayor an Anna Bailao there speaking to her crowd of supporters and just reconfirming for you that that is in fact a concession speech even though you are seeing wild applause, some chants as well. We love you, Anna. I kept on hearing over and over again as Anna Bai Lau talked about how she had no regrets. She talked about how this is a troubled city right now, but there's amazing promise 
for the future. And she says it's time for everybody to come together to especially make life more affordable. And certainly she spent quite a bit of time there congratulating Olivia Chow. Saman, I want to come to you first. You'd mentioned earlier how excited you were to see the prospect of possibly having the first Asian person, the first racialized person, an immigrant to this city as well. Lots of firsts here. Yeah, first how, woman how in are, amalgamated Toronto. It's exciting stuff. Yeah. How are you feeling as you're watching all of this? I mean, I feel pretty good. Um, you know, as progressive, sometimes it's, it's uh, we're not always used to winning, but you know, that's, <laughs> that's been changing, thankfully, in not only in uh, this mayoral election, but in 2022, when we were able to elect five new councillors um, who com had committed to progressive issues. So I think going into this next, the, the rest of this term, um, I see a lot of potential. I see a lot of opportunity. Olivia Chow is also can, uh, a, a leader and a, and a politician who has worked across the aisle many, many times in much more difficult situations than I think uh, that we're in right now. And I completely agree with Shakira. I do think that there's a lot of opportunity to, to get some big ticket things done in Toronto, mm -hmm. um, like transit, like housing, some big investments that can really push our city forward because Every candidate on the state uh, who that was running, no one was, no one was uh, saying that they wanted to keep everything the same. So um, not only did Olivia win, I think progressive ideas are winning, change is winning, uh, in the sense that that's, that was the message of every candidate, even Anna Bailao, who was in a, a key part of the previous administration. Well, when you're talking about working across the aisle, that's also true at the provincial level. I was asking Shakir earlier about Doug Ford. We've gotten a statement now from the Premier's office, and he congratulated Olivia Chow. He said that he looks forward to working together. But, Andrew, I'm just curious, when you hear during the campaign trail comments like she would be an unmitigated disaster, and then now you're seeing much kinder words in this first statement out from the Premier, how is this going to work together, Doug Ford in the Premier chair and Olivia Chow in uh, City Hall? Well, I mean, I don't think it's the first time we've seen Doug change his mind about this election. He was going to stay <laughs> out of it for the longest time. Um, so I, th I think he's, he's, he's done the responsible thing, you know, congratulated her, shown the, the kind of grace that, that you need to show as a leader. Uh, and understand, you know, Doug Ford understands that Toronto is what drives much of Ontario's economy, if not, if not Canada's, and there has to be a good relationship uh, between the Mayor of Toronto and the Premier of Ontario if they're going to get anything big done. I, I completely agree with Shakira. I think there's lots of places for Olivia Chow and Doug Ford to find common ground. Um, they may have a different idea about what some, what some solutions will be, but I think they're going to find some priorities that they both share. Shakir, when you're looking at a uh, Chow administration at City Hall, what are you thinking about in terms of a barometer for success or whether or not the city is going to look at, uh, yep, yeah, okay, she did what she needed to do. What does that look like? It's really about results. I think campaigning without having a record of being a mayor is a pretty easy thing. But she's gonna, in the next election, she's gonna have to say, I've done these things during my term as mayor. I think when you talk about affordability and cost of living, kudos on their campaign. But there are several different tax increases that are going to happen. She was very vague on what a property tax increase would look like. And I think things like that are going to affect our Antonians in a certain way. And we'll see how they react to those things, right? Not everybody's going to like those things. So we'll see what she does when she actually has a record to put up against whatever happens in the next election. But right now, you need results. You're going to build 25,000 rental homes, making the city of Toronto the developer. We'll see if that works out, right? There's a lot of promises I think are, are a little vague. And so she's going to have to deliver on these things in the next three and a half years, or at least get significant progress on implementing these things before we get to that next election. Simone, what do you think? Uh, 2026 is the next election. Doesn't seem that far away when we're I sitting know. here at this point. But what do you think success looks like when we're at that stage, looking back at her administration? Yeah, I think what we, we have to keep in mind is that change is going to be slow, but there needs to be some big steps taken. Um, of course, City Hall works a little differently than other levels of government. There, it, there aren't you no know, party lines. No one is part of Group A, Group B in the same way. It's much more fluid than that. That's what makes it interesting. And at Progress Toronto, we see before Olivia Chow was mayor, um, during, the, during, during the Tory administration, we still had a, 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 quite a few victories. So I think it would really, what Olivia Chow really needs to look at is how does she organize the inside as well as the outside to kind of push forward her agenda, make sure there aren't, there aren't uh, counselors that are kind of um, blocking her, make sure that she's using her powers of persuasion. But at the same time, organizations like Progress Toronto and advocates are, put, are putting enough pressure on the outside to get some real results done. So in 2026, we can say, hey, we, look, we did all of this. We need another mandate to make sure we 
continue taking our city down the right path. All right. Well, before we head to 2026, let's still stay in the moment. Let's still stay in tonight. And I want to go over to Angelina King now because Angelina has another update. What are you seeing? Well, what we're seeing right now is that when we're looking at across the city at all wards, they're either going to Olivia Chow or Anna Bailao. So right now we're missing just under 50 of the polls. So we're nearly there, we're nearly there. Uh, this is a really different night for Olivia Chow compared to 2014 when she last attempted a mayoral run. In 2014, Olivia Chow didn't even make a mark in Scarborough. So, you, so she has tonight a really different story, some redemption for Olivia Chow tonight. So how did she win? I can give you a bit of a breakdown right now with what we're seeing. So far, she has all six wards in Scarborough, but remember, we are still waiting for some polls to report. She did dominate in the center of our city, not a huge surprise there. So in Toronto Center, uh, she has more than 11,000 votes over Anna Bailao. Moving over to Toronto, Danforth, about 10,000 votes spread there for Olivia Chow. Of course, this is her late husband, Jack Layton's former federal riding. And then Spadina, Fort York, just about 8,000 votes for Chow over Anna Bailao. Interestingly, Olivia Chow beat Anna Bailao in her own former riding of Ward 9 Davenport. She didn't run for re-election last year. Olivia Chow also beat Josh Matlow in his current ward. He's in his fourth term uh, of city council, of course, the councillor for Toronto St. Paul's. He's been really entrenched in that community. Uh, he was first a school board trustee back in 2003. So that's where she dominated. And where she came in second, a little bit closer. So that's all of Etobicoke. Anna Bailao took all three wards there. Um, in Etobicoke North, about 800 more votes for Anna Bailao than Olivia Chow. And more than 3,000 spread in Etobicoke Lakeshore. That's an interesting ward. There's always a bit of a political tug of war there. Amber Morley did, in, uh, the, the current city councillor there, Amber Morley did endorse Olivia Chow. So not quite making it there, but enough votes from other parts of the city to get her to be our mayor-elect tonight. So Torontonians really signaling they're ready for that change, looking to the future with a more progressive Mayor Chris. They certainly are, and some stunning developments there with Olivia Chow beating Anna Bailao and Josh Matlow in their own backyards, especially when you consider how well Anna Bailao did tonight, better than many had expected, especially midway through. But of course, the storyline is that Olivia Chow has done very well, and as Angelina was saying, right across the city, particularly out in Scarborough. And I want to go now to Ali Shiasan and the Chow headquarters. Ali, what is the mood like now? I'm sure people are still pretty amped up there. That's right. It has now transitioned from viewing party to party party. Now, I want to bring in another guest. I have Aaron Morrison with me here, an NDP strategist. Just the person I want to talk to about what this win means for Toronto and perhaps beyond. But first, what do you make of the win? Really exciting win, fascinating that it came down to Bailao, which kind of represented uh, the status quo at City Hall, and Chow, which really represented a big change at City Hall. So I think change is coming. Were you surprised to see it going back and forth in terms of who was in the, the leader, uh, at least early on in the night? Yeah, no doubt. With so many candidates in that sort of top six, top seven, uh, it really could have been anybody's race today. So interesting that it came so close. Uh, and advanced polls especially really helped chow out. So I have to ask you what this means, what this win means for Toronto NDP. We've got provincial NDP and the federal NDP. Obviously, she has that name recognition, that affiliation with the party. So what does this mean to the party at the other levels of government? Yeah, good question. Uh, I mean, I think no doubt this win is Olivia's and Olivia's alone. Uh, but I would say she's got good partners throughout the country, uh, especially here in Toronto, uh, growing new Democrat base to work with. Uh, and that'll be useful for Marit Stiles as well as for the federal NDP. I think Olivia Chow is the kind of person, though, that has proven she can work across the spectrum. So I think we can also expect to see a good relationship with Doug Ford, with Justin Trudeau, and with other leaders across the country. Even though we heard recently Doug Ford describe her as an unmitigated disaster if she was to win. Yeah, you bet. I mean, look, Doug Ford said some pretty rough things about Andrea Horvath, too, and now they're working really well together. So uh, I think that's the kind of relationship we'll see them work out. I think everybody hopes to see Olivia Chow stand up when she needs to stand up to Doug Ford. Uh, but ultimately, she's already proven she can work across the aisle. And I think I think cooperation will be her first choice. Realistically, this is going to be sort of an abbreviated term as a mayor for three years. 
that she has had very ambitious promises that she made. How realistic is it to accomplish some of the things that she has charted out for herself? There's a lot to get done, no doubt. The city's got a billion dollars in debt it needs to deal with. And I think in, in the end, the votes that went for Chow went for more affordable housing, fixing the TTC, and all of those things that she talked about during the campaign. So I think she's a doer. We've seen her get a lot of things done in her time at City Hall. Great work on child care, uh, you know, great work on the nutrition program. All of those things tell us that she's a, she's a woman who can get stuff done. So hopes are high. Thank you very much, Erin Morrison, for taking the time. I will let you go now to the party. This is exactly how it's going here. I don't know if this was a news hit, per se, or a vibe check. The vibes are big here, and the votes were in Olivia Child's favor. Oh my gosh, Ali Shiasan, I love you so much. You summed it up so well there. From viewing party to party party, that is the look at Olivia Chow's campaign there. And another one of the big storylines tonight, in addition to the fact that Olivia Chow is going to be the next mayor of Toronto, is the fact that Mark Saunders, who had done well throughout this campaign, had a complete collapse tonight, finishing just around 8% support. And he has now delivered his concession speech. Let's take a listen together. Okay. Okay. <laughs> First off, let me just say thank you so much for everyone for being here. And you know what, uh, friends, family, I'm gonna let us get back to our party and to have some fun. First, I wanna thank every single candidate that took part in this election. Putting yourselves on the line means that you love the city just as much as we love the city. And we want what's best for the city of Toronto because this is the best city in the world and it is composed of amazing people. And I wanna say thank you to all of you folks out there. For all that you've done, I sincerely mean it. It has been a journey from the ground up. But I want to say congratulations to Olivia Chow. She fought a tough fight, and at the end of the day, she came out victorious. And you know what? We have to do everything we can to make this city an amazing city, an incredible city that it is, but we have so much further to do. So we have to support. Olivia Chow in that position of mayor because there's a lot of work that we all have to do. And I want to say to my team right now, it takes a village to raise a candidate. And trust me, everybody here did just that. So to everyone on the organization and field teams, to our tour team, to our data team, to our social media and digital teams, to our policy team, our communications team, and to our fundraising team, well done. there giving his concession speech to uh, his supporters and he was talking about how this is a difficult night for him certainly but thanking his supporters there and saying that it is time now for people to rally behind Olivia Chow as the next mayor of Toronto and it certainly begs the question if you were mayor what would you want done we went around the city of Toronto and asked a few people what they think take a listen find a way to tackle the affordable housing crisis get housing more affordable housing and more sustainable and healthy housing policies. So I'm never running for mayor. That's a job that I would never ever want. <laughs> no, thank you. It'd be affordability. It'd be um, finding housing for people. Um, I would invest in Parkdale, but I'm a bit biased. Uh, I guess, yeah, I guess I'd just like try to maybe accelerate a lot of the affordable housing. It's like uh, food accessibility. Uh, I would do something around that. I think I always, I always said that in a fun way of like, everybody get free food. More biking lanes in the city. Right. Uh, make more bike accessible parts of the city, I guess. Yeah. That's a really good question. <laughs> Open the books. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Let's see what's really been going on in the city, guys. <laughs> Lots of great answers there. I think free food might have been my favorite one. I don't know. I could use some of that right about now, but it's been a long campaign and a long night. Um, of course, results and analysis have certainly been the backbone of tonight, but we also wanted to make room 
for a bigger discussion about the future of our city as well. So right now I'm lucky enough to be joined by Joseph Smith with Foundation of Black Communities and a Vice Principal as well. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Diana Chan McNally is a crisis support worker and a homelessness advocate. Thank you for being here. And Stephen Mensah is the Executive Director of the Toronto Youth Cabinet. Nice to have all three of you on board for this. I'll pick up with that question because I kind of I find it kind of fun. Um, Joseph, what do you think? If you were mayor, what would you do in the city of Toronto right now? We've talked a lot about all the problems that exist in this city, but there's a lot of optimism and a lot of hope for the future. So if you were elected mayor tonight, what would be your for first order of business? Well, after my panic attack has subsided, <laughs> I'd probably think about investing in innovation infrastructure. Some people call them innovation hubs. Um, but basically spaces where businesses can be incubated, they can be accelerated, you can also have co-working spaces. So much of them are concentrated within the downtown core mm -hmm. and they aren't spread out a lot. And so that obviously further marginalizes people who often feel distant from our economic um, activities within the city. And I'd want to build them as many as possible, as many different spaces as possible away from the downtown core. Hmm. It's interesting about campaigns. I find sometimes they become so laser focused on one or two issues. In this one, we really saw housing, transit, safety were the top ones. You didn't really see much about innovation. Do you think that that was a bit of a miss through this campaign? Um, it was a bit of a miss. I think it's one of the underlying causes for many issues that we deal with. I mean, a lot of public safety conversations have come up throughout the campaigns and many people have spoken about what they would do, but they most likely spoke about it in a reactive sense. Mm -hmm. Some people had some innovation or progressive ideas about it, but um, we have to invest in some of the solutions that deal with those long time risk factors that contribute to criminal behavior and activity. And one of them is economic disparity and poverty. And so that's why the first thing I'll do would be that. Okay, Diana, I want to jump back to that first question. If you were to have been elected mayor tonight, what would be your first order of business for the city? One, I would never run, but number two... Uh, <laughs> That's not the game. you got to answer game. either way. <laughs> You're asking a homelessness advocate what they would do, and I would address homelessness. I think that should, that should be pretty obvious coming from somebody like me. Um, we're at a point in Toronto where we know that we have almost 11,000 people, according to the city's mm. own statistics, who are currently unhoused. And that doesn't actually include people who are couch surfing, for example. So we know that the numbers are far higher. Now, there's been a lot of focus on housing, but a lot of disconnect on how to relate that to people who are currently living outdoors uh, or in our shelter system. So um, I think we have to have a much more humane approach in the city than what we've previously seen. Uh, and I think actually Olivia Chow has some great ideas about what we can do um, that are quite immediate. So one idea that she's had um, is rent supplements and increasing that. So that's a way of quickly getting people into housing, mm -hmm. private market housing for the most part, but uh, to get them in there at the very least and expedite that in a very, very fast manner. So that's not a long-term solution, but we need a whole bevy of different solutions that are both short-term and long-term if we're actually going to address this crisis. There had been a lot of conversations at the beginning part of this campaign and then right throughout it as to whether or not this was gonna be a change election or not. And it certainly sounds like Toronto wanted a change. Olivia Chow, very different from her predecessors. And you just highlighted there the urgency around homelessness maybe wasn't there before. You'd mentioned that Olivia Chow has some good ideas. Do you feel like she's gonna also come with her the urgency to tackle this file? that you think so desperately needs to be done? If only because I will be hounding her. Um, <laughs> and it's not because I'm not extremely happy that we have a progressive mayor um, who is going to be in office. I'm ecstatic about that, but we can't just rest on our laurels of electing somebody. Um, so I, to call out to everybody out there, um, myself included, is to be out there and to hold people accountable. So I intend to engage with our mayor uh, about this homelessness crisis and to do that on an ongoing basis. So um, she's got great ideas and I'm here to hold her to account. All right, sounds good. And I will hold you to that as well. <laughs> Um, Stephen, I want to jump back to uh, the first question there about if you were mayor for the day, what would you do? Maybe you're the most likely of all of us to run here <laughs> as the executive director of the Toronto Youth Cabinet. So possibly in a couple of years, I might be coming to uh, ask you some more questions in a different way. But tonight, <laughs> if you were mayor tomorrow, what would you do? In the lookout for my campaign in 2030. <laughs> but my first order of business would really make unprecedented investments into the lives of young people. Unfortunately, young people in this city have suffered from decades of disinvestment and neglect, uh, be it from you know, our council and just you know, government at large. And so 
you know, really making sure that we're improving their socioeconomic conditions by you know, putting more funding towards youth employment. Toronto has the worst youth unemployment rate in all of Ontario and one of the worst and highest in Canada. Also, when we talk about homelessness in a youth lens, you know, young people are the fastest growing population of homeless individuals in Canada. And when you look at the city's uh, investments towards um, homelessness, young people are not really priority when we talk about the number of young people move from shelter system into supportive or transitional housing. So I say that would be number two. And that's thirdly, public safety issues we've seen in the city of Toronto, there's a huge need to invest in upstream uh, community-driven responses instead of downstream, I'd say, policing first uh, responses, which have proven not to, uh, you know, really have, give us the results that we want to see towards a you know, healthier and safer community at large. Every election campaign, we see stakeholder groups put out these kind of surveys to candidates, asking for them to weigh in, to answer their questions so that they can let their supporters know, hey, these are this is how the candidates would react to the things that we care about. Yeah. Um, you know, you saw that with TTC Riders, the dog park group as well. I know that your cabinet also did so as well. And when you're talking about whether or not people were paying attention to youth, one thing that I picked up on is Saunders, Bailao, not even Chow, none of the top three here even responded to your survey. Yeah. What does that tell you about the ways in which Olivia Chow and her administration may tackle youth issues? Yeah, it, it wasn't, they didn't so much confidence, but I'd say at once I am still optimistic. You know, when you look at Olivia Chow, she was one of the people who spearheaded you know, a lot of uh, youth initiatives when she was counselor and whatnot. So ultimately, it was disheartening and disappointing because you know, the messages sent to myself and young people were, you know, we're not priority. You know, we're just going to continue to skirt past you and, and focus on you know, other individuals. Yeah, you know, Toronto's young people make up a huge population in this city. And so um, overall, I am hoping to be optimistic and, you know, like Diana said, no, we're going to keep pushing hard uh, to ensure young people are a priority and that we move past the platitudes and nice words and we move towards you know, real action to support young people in the city. Okay, got it. Now, Stephen, I'm curious, as a part of a school admin, or sorry, Joseph, as a, a part of a school administration, when we're looking at leadership qualities, um, Olivia Chow obviously taking up this top job at the city. What do you think she's going to need to focus on as she's trying to unite council? She's trying to negotiate <laughs> with the province and the feds. Yeah. How's that going to look for her? Well, I think the answer is in one of the words you used, unite. Um, she's going to have to ensure that one of the biggest mandates under her belt is how do I make this a more inclusive space? She is a representative that, um, you know, represents diverse identities within the city. And so she's going to have to lean on that in order to create more space for more voices to share what they would like done, what they would like changed. And I think that's going to galvanize the support. All right, perfect. Well, it's a big discussion about the future of our city, but thank you for helping me launch it tonight. I appreciate your time, all of you. And I want to head over to Angelina King now. Uh, hey, Angelina, what's going on? Oh, I feel a little bit more calm now. <laughs> Things have calmed down. The math is getting a little bit easier. It has been a really tight race, as you all know. So I want to show you some of the real nail biters between Olivia Chow and Anna Bailao. First, the closest race played out in Humber River, Black Creek. Anna Bailao took that ward with just 15 votes. And historically, Ward 7 has a really low voter turnout. So again, if you don't think your vote matters, it does. Next, another really tight one, Don Valley East, just an 18 vote difference for Anna Bailao. Quickly, when I thought of Don Valley East, I thought about the Science Centre moving to Ontario place announced by the province. That really became a pretty big election issue. Uh, many residents there unhappy with the move. And Anna Bailo and Olivia Chow were split on that. Anna Bailo supported the move, build some housing with the freed up land. Olivia Chow is against it. I'm curious how much that played a factor. Another uh, really tight race was in Scarborough Rouge Park. 43 votes spread there for Anna Bailao. And then in Willowdale, it was also really tight. 44 vote difference there for Olivia Chow. No, we are still waiting for 12 polls to report, but we're getting a little bit closer and uh, keeping my eye on those ones that we're still waiting for to come in. Chris? All right, certainly. But uh, this is quite the, the big night for Olivia Chow and her campaign team. Mayor-elect there, they are all excited and waiting for the mayor-elect to come out and deliver her victory speech. We are being told by her campaign team that that is likely to come in about 10 to 15 minutes. So stay with us here on the broadcast and we will share Olivia Chow's speech as it comes in. But 
even before they hear it, those people are certainly pretty jacked up and excited. Um, I was asking the earlier panel uh, about what success looks like for an Olivia Chow administration. Diana, I'm curious, from your perspective, what would you say would be the barometer for success as we're gauging what happens with Olivia Chow as she embarks on her term as mayor? I think on the ground, it would it would actually result in small changes that are tangible, things that we can actually see. Um, you know, there's been a lot of discourse around small things like trash uh, being pretty much everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, how we see our services declining, we see the TTC being cut, and I think if we start to see those things at least stopping, but hopefully really being reversed. That, to me, would be the barometer of success, those little tangible things that we can see that make the city much more livable for all of us. Stephen, what do you think? What would so, be a barometer for sec success from your perspective? You know, at the end of the day, I want to be able to talk to a young person in, what, two, three years and you know, ask them, you know, how do you feel? Like, how's the situation, Toronto? Like, how do you feel? And I think at the, at the core, my message has been that we want a mayor who's going to provide young people with a hope for a better future, because currently young people don't have that hope for a better future. And so I'd say in two, three years, you know, young, young, when you're talking to a young person, they have that hope for a better future. They're able to live in the city of Toronto. Toronto's more equitable, and Toronto's more youth-friendly, a uh, place where they're able to succeed, prosper, and, you know, and reach their full potential. OK, and Joseph, how about for you? We're watching this uh, shot here of Olivia Chow's campaign headquarters. They're obviously yeah. really excited. They think that she's going to have a very successful uh, time in office. As you're looking at her next weeks and, and years ahead, yeah. what would you decide would be a barometer for success for Olivia Chow? Got to agree with Dan. I mean, we are operating on a, about over $16 billion operating budget to keep services delivering at the pace they're currently delivering at. And the growing need for those services just continues to mount and mount. And so her ability to ensure that we extract more resources from various spaces to ensure that those services are delivering at that same pace mm. and they can accommodate the growing need, that's going to be one of the key things we're all going to be looking at. One of the big things that was talked about during this campaign was money and how yeah. things were going to be paid for. Olivia Chow took quite a lot of heat through this campaign for not putting a dollar figure on how much property taxes would go up under her administration. She kept on saying it would be modest, though people were throwing attacks at her saying, what does that even mean? What's that going to look like? Certainly, it seems like a uh, majority of Torontonians didn't seem to mind either which way. Um, what do you think, uh, Joseph, about that in terms of where people's priorities were at as they were casting their ballot? I think people are aware that Olivia Chow is inheriting something that has already been preset in terms of the councillors already in positions and seats. And so while on the one hand you want to be progressive and innovative with your ideas, you also have to wait and see what you're actually receiving and what can actually be done with the people that are working with you. And so I understand um, the concern around saying too much, uh, but we are, are all going to be looking to see what's actually going to be done because there are concerns about that raising. Okay, and as you're seeing on your screen right now, Olivia Chow uh, at her campaign headquarters. Mike Layton is speaking and introducing her. Obviously, this is the son of Jack Layton, Olivia Chow's uh, former husband. He passed away a number of years ago, and his son and former counselor, Mike Layton, is now introducing Olivia Chow. Let's listen in. That Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaty signed with multiple Mississaugas in Chippewa, Bands. I'd like to finally say that this land is also subject with the dish with one spoon wampum. And for me, that means that we all have a bond with the land and with each other. And that what we take, we must also return. Thanks, Mike. I'm Sarah Layton, and on behalf of all of our family, And on behalf of all of our family, I'm so excited and proud to have the honour of welcoming my stepmother, the next Mayor of Toronto, Olivia Chow! Yeah. 
Thank you, Toronto! <laughs> Thank you, everyone. <laughs> wow, what a night. <laughs> If you ever doubted what's possible together, if you, if you ever questioned your faith in a better future and what we can do with each other, for each other, tonight is your answer. Thank you to the people of Toronto for the trust you've placed in me and the mandate for change as your new mayor. <laughs> and whether you voted for me or not, we're united in our love yeah. for this great city. <laughs> I pledge to you I will delegate myself to work tirelessly in building a city that's more caring, affordable, and safe, where everyone belongs. <laughs> Toronto, my home. I immigrated here when I was 13, to this place of hope where my family found an affordable apartment in St. Jamestown. My father had mental illness and could not work, but my mother was able to pay the rent and put food on the table. With one single income as a hotel maid, Toronto was a place where I could later afford my own apartment after university. And that's where my mother came to live with me and rebuild her life after my dad hurt her very badly. Me on the mattress, on the floor, mom on the bed. She could heal because she had a home. Toronto was a place where someone like me could afford to grow up, become a school trustee, a city councillor, and a member of parliament. It's where I served the city with passion and love, where I worked hard to champion the well-being of children. And while I've been knocked down a few times over the years, yeah, just like you, I always got back up. Because the people of this city, all of you, are worth the fight. I know things are tough these days. It's harder to get by and harder to get around. It takes longer. But don't give up. Toronto is a place of hope, a place of second chances, right? <laughs> A city where an immigrant kid from St. Jamestown can be standing in front of you as your new mayor. Toronto's future because we all shared one thing, hope. Yeah. The hope that comes from finding an affordable place to live. Yeah. Hope that our kids can grow up in a city of opportunity. The hope of a city that's strengthened by compassion, not weakened by inequality. A place where, if we chip in a little more, we can improve public services and make our city.
Yeah, improve public service and make our city more livable. Yeah. That's hope. That shared belief in what's possible is what will sustain us in the months ahead. Building more affordable housing. Yeah. Making TDC safer, faster, <laughs> and more reliable, huh? Yeah. Keeping Ontario Place public. Where, where the, my grandkids and I can watch the sunset and skip storms. <laughs> Building a city that cares. That's what we are all about, right? But the work of changing a city left behind by a decade of neglect is not going to be easy. Okay? The work of change is always hard. We will face some roadblocks along the way, but I know we can make it happen by committing ourselves to each other and to the city we love. <laughs> Our work to build a city where everyone belongs starts right now. <laughs> now, speaking of working together, I said to Premier Ford, who graciously called me tonight, and, and his, and his um, minister, Steve Clark, called me and he said, we look forward to working together. Yes. We look forward to finding common ground, right? Because I know we both believe in this people of this city. The, and yes, we both believe in it. We love the city. The people have sent a message today. They want to get things done. Yeah. yeah. Like building affordable housing and improving TTC. <laughs> well, Mr. Premier, we're ready. Let's work together to get it done. And to the Prime Minister, I look forward to working with your government. A healthy and a livable Toronto is essential to a strong Toronto. And Canada, a strong Canada. <laughs> yes. yeah. Now, this, can this campaign had so many talented candidates, and I spoke to them. Anna Bailao, Mark Saunders, Josh Matlow. I, I, I phoned them, they phoned me, and we pledged to work together. Okay? And of course, Mitzi Hunter, Anthony Fury, Brad Bradford, and Chloe Brown. Yes. And my friend, Gil Penalosa, who worked with me for a day. I, I want to thank you for all, the sh of the, for all of you to sharing your ideas and your passion. We all share a deep love for this city. And, and I'm driven by a common belief that everyone should have an affordable place to live. So to all the candidates, each one of you, and to Toronto City Council, to the public service, business and labor, yeah, civil society, community leaders, yeah, and the people of this great city. 
I invite you to join me and let's work together to make the promise of an affordable home a reality for everyone. And to follow a saying that the Somali mothers have taught me, if, if we come together, we can man a crack in the sky. Yes, indeed, we can man cracks in this city. To my family, Sarah and Hugh, Mike and Brett and Sally, I love you. <laughs> thank you, thank you for standing beside me all these years. And to my beautiful grandkids, Beatrice, Solace, Phoebe and Chloe. <laughs> I hope your grandma Ollie makes you proud. <laughs> And to the best campaign team in the country. <laughs> All of you. All of you. <laughs> yeah. You made this campaign a home for everyone. Yes. Yes. And they led with heart, passion, and hard work every single day. Thank you so, so very, very much. And to the thousands of volunteers. And there were, and just today, there were 2,500 volunteers out in the street today. Throughout the campaign, you knocked on half a million doors. You made calls. Yeah, and you paint the city purple with t-shirts and signs. <laughs> you gave me strength after long days of door knocking, public events, debates, and there were a lot of debates, yeah? <laughs> we joined together to rebuild the promise of our city. Reorganize block by block. Yes, your love, your compassion, your commitment and your stories filled me with the energy to fight for you every day. Your stories are the inspiration of this campaign. People like the fears and our famous Dahlia, yeah, is she here today? <laughs> Who struggle between paying rent and having great food to eat at the end of the month. Her story resonated with so many people across this city. Or Joseph, who can't retire even though he was exhausted and bone tired because his rent is just too high. Or Sarah, a childcare worker who was trapped in an abusive relationship like so many women in our city, in our country, like my mother, because she couldn't afford a place for her and her kids. It was tough. They are why we must continue to work for change. Yes. So, are you ready to go and get to work? Yeah, we're ready. Yes. Together, we will open up City Hall. Join me in the work ahead. Yeah. Join me with each other for each other because I need you to keep speaking out with your ideas, keep helping out, keep caring for each other, because what we've won today is an opportunity, okay? 
a starting point in our journey towards a more affordable, safe, and caring city. So you're sure now you're ready, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Together, we can create a better city. Thank you so much. Toronto, you have been listening along to Mayor-elect Olivia Chow giving her victory speech in front of a packed house and a very excited crowd. She thanked the city for the trust that uh, we have put in the mayor-elect and this mandate for change. She says she is on a mission to build a more affordable, safe, and caring city where everybody belongs. And she talked a bunch of times there about how many times she'd been knocked down, obviously looking back at her political uh, career as well as her story as an immigrant coming to this country. She talked about the struggles that she and her family had faced and then also the perseverance that got her into council then as an MP and now as the next mayor of Toronto as well. A lot to chew on in that uh, victory speech but certainly one of the big things that we saw throughout this campaign was a real mission from Olivia Chow to talk more specifically about her own personal story as being an immigrant. She talked about how she shied away. She was nervous about her uh, English skills, perhaps, in 2014. And she said this time she was just going to lean right into who she was, and that would be a guiding principle of not just her campaign, but also her administration as well. Diana, what do you think? This is a historic night, obviously, for so many reasons. Uh, Olivia Chow becoming the first Asian person to be in that seat. Um, she is obviously also the first person of color, the first racialized person to be in that seat as well, an immigrant to this country. What do you think it was about her personal story that related and resonated with so many people within this city? I think it resonated because she is the city. This is what the city demographic looks like. If we look at who is actually living in Toronto, we're looking at the majority of people um, are racialized. They're coming from other countries. We have a huge population of people who are newcomers, immigrants. Uh, and I think that absolutely speaks to people's own experiences. My mother, like Olivia Chow, um, immigrated uh, to Canada from China. Uh, and so when I look at Olivia Chow, I actually literally kind of see my mother because they actually look <laughs> extremely similar. Uh, it's a little disconcerting, actually. But I see that story reflected there as well. And so I think it's so important for people to see themselves represented. But at the same time, we can't just rest on representation. We need to see action to make sure that the city is actually more inclusive uh, for everybody who lives here. So I'm hoping with Olivia that will be the case. Well, and there did seem to be a lot more excitement around this campaign. We saw the advance voting was up. Uh, by 12% over 2022, and now our decision desk has al also determined that more ballots were actually cast in this by-election than in the general election uh, that we just had last fall, which is quite big given the historic tradition, frankly, of by-elections and summer elections mm -hmm. having a real struggle with voter turnout and getting people to the polls. Um, Stephen, I'm curious, she had so much hope in her messaging. How, how big of a factor do you think that piece was in drawing people out to the polls to come and, and to turn out in bigger numbers than we saw last fall? Yeah, I'd say, you know, just looking at the way Toronto, unfortunately, has deteriorated be out services and just, I guess, that, that, that vibe and just that, you know, the energy. I know I have friends and other individuals who, who say, like, Toronto's just dead, you know, like, they don't really feel that, um, don't really feel alive in the city of Toronto. So I think her message has resonated, obviously, and, and, and hopefully um, I, we'll see it through her actions and we'll see it through her policies, policies that are really going to, once again, provide young people, just all the Torontonians with that hope for, once again, a better future. Uh, and, and, and when she talks about making sure everyone is, feels welcome, that everyone is cared for in this city, I feel like um, her message uh, and hopefully her actions will back that up as well. Well, and she did speak about in that speech how she wanted to 
unite everybody, bring people together. Obviously, yeah. that meant different people across the city, people mm -hmm. from different political stripes as well. Uh, former Mayor John Tory has now congratulated uh, the mayor-elect on taking this, this job that he resigned from earlier this year, congratulating her, noting the fact that he knows her, knows her well, and knows that she loves this city as well. So certainly it seems like we're seeing a lot of folks jumping into this bandwagon to congratulate. And um, Joseph, I'm curious, one of the points that Olivia Chow continually has said throughout the campaign, and even in that speech just there, that she wanted to build a city where everybody felt like they belong. Mm. How do you do that? Hmm. <laughs> big <laughs> so question. A, a big question, <laughs> and it's something that I've been challenged or tasked with doing within my respective spaces of leadership. And it's not easy, because the first stab at it, you have to combat people's distrust people's feeling like they've been marginalized for so long or disaffected, um, and you have to rev them up. And I think the grounds full of enthusiasm she's been able to cultivate is the first step to getting them to buy in mm -hmm. to a message that she'll have to continuously market so that it takes root, that this is a place where everyone can find themselves, and this is a place where it's reflective of people's diverse identities. And so it's going to take time. It's not going to be simple. Um, but I think she has her ear to the ground, and I think she's willing to hear what folks need from her and from the city to feel like they actually belong. Okay, absolutely. And I'm a pretty optimistic guy. I want to end the uh, show here as we start to wind down our election coverage with a little bit of a, a happy note. What's the favorite thing? What's the thing that you love about this city? Olivia Chow is going to be the next uh, mayor. Maybe it's something that she can improve on if it's already good. I don't know. Joseph, what do you think? What's going to be... What's your favorite thing about the city of Toronto? It, since I was a kid, it was always the diversity, the diversity here. I mean, I remember being young, growing up in the Jane and Finch community, and everybody from every walk of life was present within that community, and we um, were able to share similar stories, and it was common ground. But when there are points of differences, they didn't seem like they, they contributed to conflict, right? And so um, I think in this city, there is incredible momentum around that feature of our city. It's very unique. We stand out as a world-class city when it comes to that. And I think that's something we have to cherish, especially looking at global and local events over the past five, six years. It's something I think we've had to appreciate more. Okay, Diana, how about for you? What's your favorite thing about the city of Toronto? I think initially I was gonna say the arts and creativity because we have such amazing artists and musicians in Absolutely. the city. Um, unheralded a little too much, to be honest. Um, but I think after actually watching that speech, I'm gonna say how much people care. Mm. Um, this city has been beaten down. Um, we've seen how much it's declined in recent years, but to rise against that um, with this message of hope, to see so many people not just voting for somebody with that kind of message, but just going out to vote, um, I think says a lot about people's care uh, about Toronto. And to see that happening now, it gives me a lot of hope for the future. And Stephen, how about for you? What's your favorite thing about the city of Toronto? Listen, I don't think Mayor Lech Chow can get, you know, the Leafs to get to the final. <laughs> but I will Not say uh, sports, you know, our sports teams and the way they're able to unite the city and bring everyone together, you know, what, despite any differences, despite any challenges the city may have. You know, when we talk about the power of sports and unifying people, mm -hmm. um, yeah, Toronto Raptors, FC, so on and so forth, they, mm -hmm. they've done a good job of really bring the city together, and hopefully that's exactly what uh, Mayor Elect Chow is going to do. You're kind of picking up on my favorite thing, because we just went through Pride Weekend, and I felt the exact same way. We have these world-class events that bring yep. millions of people from all over the world to this wonderful city to get to see it. And I just think festivals like that, moments like that where you're uniting people, bringing them together, it just shows how strong, resilient, and powerful this city can be. Uh, Angelina, my friend, you've been with us all night. Great job tonight giving us all the results. That was my favorite part of the broadcast. What's your favorite part of the city? Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, that's such a tough one. I think I'm going to have to go with Joseph and say diversity, diversity in our people and our ideas like we saw along the campaign trail. Every day can be different. You can go and get pho and see a comedy show on Friday, go get jerk chicken and live music on Saturday. But because, Chris, I am your numbers woman for the night, I want to give you one last update talking about diversity and a lot of diverse candidates. Molly the dog got nearly 600 votes tonight. No way. She did. She did. <laughs> way to go, Molly. Love ya. Oh, uh, Angelina, that's fantastic. Okay, so that's what the five of us love the most about this city. How about you? We went around and we asked uh, folks around town what they think the best part of the city is, and here are some of those answers. 
um, micro cities all around the city. The different communities, um, how everyone supports each other, uh, how we all try to help our neighbors where we can. The four months of the summer that I get. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of um, diversity here, which leads to a lot of different ideas, which leads to a lot of different businesses. You can go through the city and the maybe wild things you'll see happening because there's just different people that do different things with different interests. And it makes the city really eclectic and I really appreciate that. Um, the people are amazing and there's people from so many walks of life here um, who seem to all come together really nicely and coexist and just make it like a really nice place to, to, uh, to be in. So many people picking up on that thing and so many people loving this incre incredible, diverse city. Now all eyes will be watching to see how Olivia Chow tries to make it even better. I want to thank all of our panelists who joined me on the program tonight. And of course, our rock star team of journalists, Angelina here in studio with me, Sean for helping make it all make sense, Ali, Dale and Meg for bringing the vibe in the field. Thank you also to Ramna Shazad and our stellar team of producers and technicians behind the scenes, and also to our live studio audience. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. It's been wonderful to have your energy in this room. And also to you, wherever you're watching, for streaming us live, we appreciate you making CBC Toronto your election night choice. We have much more coverage coming throughout the evening. And in the days ahead, cbc.ca slash Toronto is your destination for up-to-the-minute information and analysis. And I have a full recap of tonight's results on CBC Television. Join me at 11 p.m. I'm Chris Glover. It has been so great spending the night with you once again. And I hope everybody has a great night.